Now we really want to um, look at the fuel weight to power output and other other sorts of um, other sorts of issues in the long run. So um, tomorrow on the power pellet, we're really going to be configuring that whole uh, run and test bed, um, and then we'll Sunday we'll run it all day, probably stop that night, and then we'll step into probably Monday starting a, a, a longer run on it. Okay. Um, this weekend we're doing it as a, a, a core three-day weekend because the projects we want to do this time are a little longer and we want to involve everyone in the setup of, of these projects. These aren't push button, they go sorts of endeavors. So really tomorrow is going to be the, the assembling of, of all of those projects. So the power pellet project, uh, the biochar project is similarly going to be using the back as a test bed to run about six or seven different pyrolysis modes um, on top of this single reactor, um, running one fuel in the different modes at an approximation of an equal uh, temperature and resonance time. What we're trying to do at the back is to take the discussion of biochar beyond just resonance time and, um, and temperature and RAM, and also try to generate some real data about what the different process modes do to the char in terms of its, um, you know, its, its physical characteristics as well as understand how that affects um, soil performance. So much of our, our biochar work right now is, work, is either working on a lab scale um, bench top thing where you're, you're using hot nitrogen sweep gas across the char to generate the char, which is not in any way an immaculate neutral scenario to make a char. There's very specific things it does to the char. Okay. Um, and then out in the world when we're actually going to deploy this, we have some very real industrial dependencies about how you can make this reasonably economically and process-wise. So again, we're trying, to trend, we're trying to transit that space. So I think we need to understand the, get some real data on what these different process modes do to char, and then use that to better define the types of reactors we want to use. What's Alex? the feedstock you're working with for long shells? Or? No, we're going to work with the cedar, cedar, cedar ships, okay? Um, so the char is not going to be you know, terribly exciting in terms of any amendments in it. Um, it's just going to be basic woody biochar feed or woody biomass feed. Okay, but hopefully coming out of it, we'll have a series of samples, um, at, at least one in each of these modes at one temperature that we can get analyzed for its physical characteristics, and then um, um, hopefully do some sort of trials on on it later. Okay, and depending on how well we do, then we'll start a, a running those six across different temperature ranges or, or something, okay? And then going from there, um, you know, in the months, months ahead, we want to start running different fuels through those, those regimes. So we're hoping to be able to use the BEC as a platform where we can d develop you know, a database of char samples and performance that isn't drawn from comparing research on different machines in different places at completely different scales and run parameters and whatnot but instead try to get this common base where at least the reactor is the same. It's the section where the effects of the heat and the gas flow are on this is, is, is equal because it's one thing. And then we change all these other parameters about how things go through there. Okay? So that's kind of a larger project of the BEC. I mean, the BEC isn't a, a, a deployment machine. Um, it will do kind of small-scale plot sort of char production. But it's really a proving machine. It's, um, it's a kind of interim machine where we can under, better understand these modes and better understand what's needed in the, the, the um, um, engineering solution such that we can mix and control the modes in interesting ways. So probably the, the main thing we did with it was come up with a method where you can real time vary all the parameters and go between the different pyrolysis modes by flipping some levers and changing gas flow and whatnot. And that was a very interesting three-dimensional thermal chemical problem. Uh, are there some modes that are producing more TARs than other modes you find in practice? Very much so. Um, and that's also uh, affected by temperature. And what's in those TARs changes significantly with, with temperature. Um, so one of the main, uh, main things I'm interested in figuring out on the bed is what happens by um, the direction you're ta just simply taking the gas off of the bed. Are you taking the gas away from the main char, or are you taking it back over the char? 
Um, if someone's looking just at yield, they're typically very interested in taking the gas back over the char because you'll get various types of secondary reactions and deposition and whatnot that will increase your, your yield. But depending on the temperature, those gases can be rather nasty and what they're putting back in the char can you know, um, be a significant amount of PAHs, which um, could have uh, negative effects. It seems that the more biocidal chars um, get, I, I can't make that characterization. It's, we're interested in the, the, the impacts of, the potentially positive impacts of some level of biocidal character in the char. And um, Benny's group in Israel is doing very interesting work around um, what are the potentially positive triggers that are, that, are, that are happening because of the slightly toxic nature of the char. And that's, that's coming from the tarps. <coughs> so how you move that gas around off of the char is going to have a huge impact on that. Um, so the Beck is set up in ways in which you can switch back and forth um, and really mix the, the, those, those variables. Is that a big issue for food crops? No one knows. So I don't know. Okay. So the Beck simile, it's mostly assembled right now. We're going to be doing all the, the final configuration on it tomorrow. Um, Jay has is, uh, finally started the very interesting um, and for many of us in-game work in this about finding reasonable ways to go from the raw gas to, to a liquid. Um, really where we're trying to go in this is a multimodal platform that will take in um, biomass in a wide variety of, of forms and output a wide variety of power and products. Okay? So right now we have it um, working off of common wood chips. Um, this isn't a fuel agnostic reactor in any, in any manner. It's still based on a, um, a ember type downdraft reactor. We've done all sorts of interesting um, um, thermal recycling and better chemical handling, but it's still at its core uh, a throated nozzle gasifier. And that has a variety of uh, liabilities that um, you can't get around in terms of different fuel sizes. Okay. Um, particularly as you go to, towards smaller fuels, which as fuels get less valuable um, they, and uh, more readily available, they're often going down in the, in the smaller size, so ag waste and general shredded material and whatnot. So um, right now we're working with the, the wood chips as a general fuel. We can output electricity, heat, and shaft power. So the current power pallet um, is purposely developed around the ability to um, return um, electricity, heat as water off the engine, and shaft power as a PTO off of the, the, the front of the engine. Um, we found the combination of those three things are, are, are regularly asked for by um, most of the developing world projects that are interested in these things. And this really is a rural or a developing world in an optimized technology. We get a lot of requests from um, agricultural co-ops or food processing areas where they need to do they need electricity to run, run fans and motors and typical things. They need heat to do drying and they need the shaft power to run you know, pumps and mills and, and whatnot. So they want those three combinations of things. We've got to that point. Um, the next two big steps that will be coming in the future is a manner to get biochar meaningfully simultaneously with, with the power. And that's beyond just taking, taking biochar out of the ash bin or taking charcoal. It's been very high temperature charcoal. So we, we have some next steps where we will be producing combined energy and biochar in meaningful ways with variation across those. And then further down the road, integrating some amount of, of liquid fuel making into it. So we want to get this single pod platform that has all of these things in it. And this is a long-standing idea. This is nothing new, but the reality of, of making that in something that's more than a, a, a press release and at best a demo um, with you know uh, a few million dollars of, of DOE money is is difficult. Um, the the you know, uh, community power corporation has has done some in it, but at, at price points that are in the five to ten dollar watt range, um, which is currently making sense for the military, but really no one else. Um, they're, they're really, most of these small scale um, biomass to fuels things are, are only right now meaningful at, at you know, very large research dollars. So the military has had the most successful so far. 
So we're trying to see how well we can move this down into the, the expert configuration of crap and DIY makeable range. So the big question on that right now is what can we realistically do on the, on the gas to fuels front, which is actually a, a very hard problem. Um, in some ways much harder than gasification. I, my early interest in this was in the, the gas to fuels process and <clears throat> when I started building gasifiers and going through the literature I, I, I found this, the raw reactors to be such a catastrophe and the, the basic gasification problem is so poorly solved that I, I decided to solve, work on that first and six years later or five years later I'm only now kind of getting to a point that we can think about dealing with the, the liquid stuff. <clears throat> Okay, so anyways, Jay's going to run that. Okay, and that should be, that should be very very interesting. Um, Marcus is going to continue on the the Lister Spark conversion project. Um, a big thing with what we do here is try to, as much as possible, build as little as possible. The goal in manufacturing is to build nothing. Um, you never get there. Okay, but you want to whenever there's a pre-existing object or solution in the world, you want to leverage that. Okay, so you know we use pre-existing barrels. Um, we use sheet metal and plumbing, and you know we, we try to not have any exotic parts or weird dependencies in the things we make, so that it's easier, it's cheaper, and we can move it elsewhere right now. So this goes for engines too, um, and we have huge deployments of small-scale engines around the world. Two of the most famous ones being the Lister diesel and the China diesel. So we are interested in when we're developing for engines. You know, it makes sense to use an engine that. Um, when you figure out that solution, you have a reasonable deployment potential. So um, we very early started working with the Lister and the, and the China Diesel because should we come up with a very good in integration on top of that, well, you know, there's, there's some large number of them in the world. Um, I, I, don't, uh, the, I think the, 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 the built number in China, of the, the, China the small China Diesel is in, is in the, the hundreds of millions. It's, it's a shocking number. I don't know. I don't know the specific point, but. So um, we first started working on those in, in dual fuel forms. Um, you can run wood gas into an engine or a diesel engine. Um, as a, you run it in a dual in a dual fuel scenario, where you still use a little pilot injection of the the liquid fuel to give you essentially your spark or your lighting event, and if you bring the wood gas in um, through the air intake and <coughs> the wood gas is very detonation resistant, so it won't actually fire until the in uh, little injection event of, of the diesel. Uh, the problem is you're trying to get to the, the least amount of diesel as possible, and on these little engines, it takes very little diesel for them under no load to, to run up. Um, and it's very difficult to, con con because they have so little um, internal, internal mechanical resistance, um, you can get into runaway states very easily on the diesel part of it. So, we found the control of it incredibly touchy. And after you've done all, all the work to make the gas fire work, uh, it's unfun to still be using any liquid fuels. So um, it's much more pleasant when you've done this impossible thing with these tanks and, and wood, and gas comes out and the engine runs and there's, there's no liquid. It's much more conceptually satisfying. So, um, we, so we've been looking at, well, how can we reasonably do spark conversions on diesel engines and, and make that something that, that doesn't require a machining effort? So we've been uh, working with both the, the Lister and the, uh, and the China diesel to find spark plug solutions that can go in through the existing injector hole and come up with timing and ignition scenarios that can, that can bolt on reasonably. So we're on the, the second or third generation of that. Uh, lap this time, the, the spark plug in the Lister is going in over the, the, um, the compression changeover valve on the side of the head, which is a, um, an artifact from the early Lister days when you increase the compression to get it start, to start cold, and then you decrease the compression so that it would run and not destroy its bearings. Okay? They didn't run diesel engines at the, at the compressions that we do today because they didn't have the materials to deal with the trip. Why do you have to use a diesel engine? What's the, the reasoning behind it? Um, because they exist, and there's lots of them. <coughs> That's cheap. the main. Yeah. It's because otherwise, you'd, otherwise, you'd rather not. Yeah. Um, or I'd rather not. I mean, I, I think the spark, the spark it, uh, versions of them have a lot of attractions. 
Are you running those diesels at high compression or reduced compression? Um, it's being, well, that's 